John has asked me to, to uh, spur things along with a few questions, and John will just go. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I was sharing with a, a group of us today, John uh, knows this material inside and out, and, and you'll get a taste of it today. I was thinking as you were talking, Barbara, that it's, uh, there's so much richness in this material that John has summarized, and it's, it's in his book. I'll hold up the book over here. It's in this book which I highly recommend. It's available in Kindle, <laughs> which for some of us makes it more accessible. Um, there's so much in here, and I was thinking that if you could, if, if as participants today, if you can come away with just one of these nuggets, and it's full of these, come up with one of them, it has the capacity to change your view of not only addiction and recovery, but I think psychology and also possibly your lives. And so it's, it's that kind of thing. So don't feel frustrated like you need to master or absorb all of it. If you just get one nugget, that'll be enough. John is full of nuggets, so I want to introduce you. John's going to talk about uh, some history to start with, right, John? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, so a little bit of the history and what is integral recovery. So uh, I'm 58, so it's a long story, but let me start at some place that has a logical beginning uh, uh, for this for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, Pam and I, were working in southern Utah where we now continue to live in the therapeutic wilderness industry. Mm -hmm. And these were programs where it initially started out with adolescents, but then moved on to adults. I mean, they moved on to be adults, most of them, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, we started working with adults also. And uh, families would send their children to us who were having problems, uh, various problems. However, as we began to compare notes throughout the industry, we found that fully 85% of all the young people that were showing up were there because of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And not all of them were full-fledged addicts. Some of them were just going through a rebellious acting out stage of abusing, and, and I'll talk later about you know, what's the difference between drug abuse and addiction. But a good majority, I would say, of those were actually full-blown addicts. And uh, wilderness therapy is a wonder, wonderful intervention. If you need a shift gears in your life, go spend eight or nine weeks uh, sleeping under the stars mm -hmm. and traveling through the mountains and the deserts of southern Utah. It is a life changer in many ways, but it's not treatment for addiction. So uh, what was passing at that point, in my opinion, in the programs I was working in uh, for uh, drug addiction treatment wasn't much. So I began to think about it. And at that point, there were not many experts on addiction or alcoholism. Usually in the field of, of addiction and treatment, what passes as an expert is somebody who solidly has a number of years of, of recovery time via AA or some other 12-step group. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's very useful. I'm not putting that down. It's a, it's a great perspective, but it does not make one an expert because you had brain surgery on you at one point doesn't make you a brain surgeon, but it does give you a, a personal experience of brain surgery that's very useful. So, and also it doesn't mean you can run around up and down mountains and do all the stuff I always wanted my experts to do. So pretty soon, uh, oh, going back, I was given the opportunity to start my own program, design it from the ground up, and I wanted to work with adults. That way I wasn't competing with all my friends who had adolescent programs, but we could work with this, and I wanted the focus to be alcoholism and addiction, because that was the main thing. And I was trying to hire people, and like I said, I couldn't find that recovery expert. And I had to start fashioning myself into the recovery expert. And reading the books on the neuroscience and everything I get my hands on, I immersed myself in 12 steps, which I, I knew and had worked through before my own life. But uh, I started to really get this major intuition that, you know, this is not a very good, I mean, this is really missing. Uh, it's, there's something not going on here. So I started moving toward a more holistic model. We have to include the body, we have to include, I was trying to get my students to meditate, and they're like, anyway. <laughs> and we would do, we'd do a vision quest at the end, and we use sweat lodges, you know, for prayer and, and, and deepening. It was really a beautiful program. But this whole kind of holism was kind of a, just this fuzzy mix mash of different things that I was kind of just intuitively thinking about. And uh, somewhere in, during that process, I came across a paper by Ken Wilber, and I had read his earlier works when I was in graduate school some years before. And the name of the, the PDF file, it wasn't, it, it's turned into a book now, but it was called uh, What is Aqual, which, or What is Integral? And Aqual is the acronym for all quadrants, all lines, all levels, all states, and all types, which we'll talk about. So I was reading, it's about 40, 45 pages, and 
I'm just, I just have one of these eureka moments. It's like, gee, oh my God, this is the Rosetta Stone for addiction and recovery. All of a sudden, it all, all the pieces that were missing and how they fit together and what needed to be included and what didn't need to be included and all this stuff just like just passed before my eyes and I was like, amazing. So I was so sure that this was just a great idea and that there must be people all over the place applying this model to this particular issue. And so I got on the phone and called the Integral Institute and they were like, yeah, right, thank you, Clay. They were pretty busy and I was, didn't bother me at that point. I was so, I was in a state of grace, if you will, by this, this great thing I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And I was on the internet. I, it was like, there's nobody doing this that I could find. Mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> I began to think that, oh my gosh, maybe I'm supposed to run with this. So that was pretty sobering pun intended. And um, I did. So I started reading. I caught up on all of Ken's work. And I just started putting this together, reading and reading, and started talking about it. And I uh, wrote some papers. And they were published. And I started getting some uh, a recognition. And somehow in the integral community, a uh, small community of people that were working with Ken's work and kind of pushing to this level of awareness or consciousness, which we'll talk about later, uh, started contacting me for their um, Hey, are you the integral recovery guy? And I go, well, yeah, I guess I am. Well, I have a brother, I have a son, I have a daughter. And our home in uh, Wayne County, Utah, uh, in a, a little dwarf of Teasdale, started to become a um, recovery center. So we would uh, you know, have our, our uh, house packed with attics and the different bedrooms and <laughs> places, and we started doing this work. And uh, they arrived. and. Um, very interesting. And then I said, well, I had all, they sent me all these videos of Ken Wilbur, who, has anybody ever heard Ken speak or read any of his book? It's, it's pretty up there. So I said, I'll just, I'll just uh, <clears throat> let my students watch the videos and, and see what happens. You know, I don't have to say anything. Ken's teaching. And so I turned the videos and everybody was, <laughs> and I went, okay, okay. I guess I'm going to have to teach this. So that's where I started uh, working with this stuff. And a lot of people say that the book is probably the, the best, easy to understand inter introduction to, to integral theory. Mm -hmm. And they call me in integral circles lovingly, I think, dumb it down Dupuy. I make it pretty understandable <laughs> and pretty, pretty applicable. So that became the, uh, um, uh, the beginnings of the book. And I was writing this all up. And, um, um, I had a, a my, in my first group, I had an assistant who was a brilliant uh, editor and writer, but, well, I won't mention his name here, but anyway, uh, but not very good with people. So I, was, so I said, look, okay, I've got all these scraps and stuff in here. Can you start organizing them? So he was doing what he did really well, and he'd worked with Ken Wilbur, and it was really great at it. And so he started putting together the beginnings of the papers that eventually evolved into the book. So that's how... Um, how it worked. And of course, every student that I was working with uh, in the integral process became my teacher. I mean, and, and to this day, when I work with clients, when I work with students, when I work with families, it just keeps revealing itself more and more. And in the, the last part of the introduction of the book, I say that this book is not meant to be the last word on integral recovery, like, you know, das Buch. You know, it's meant to be the first word. Yeah. And the model, you, as you'll see, is a very evolutionary model. So the more we learn, the more we practice, the more science is developed, the more experiences we have, technologies, techniques, it just keeps getting better and more beautiful. And the question I get often <clears throat> is, what is integral recovery? And I'll give you the very, um, just the, the, the elevator uh, version, like two floor version. Uh, it's, it's the map, okay, that I was discussing aqua or the integral map developed by Ken Wilbur and the rest of us now who've been working with this for some years and it is the practices mm -hmm. so the map <clears throat> reveals to you what needs to be looked at the country that needs to be traveled the canyons and the rivers and the mountains that need to be traversed and the practices give you a day-to-day -day ongoing lifetime practice to keep yourself in the zone of sobriety health recovery and <clears throat> more than just not using drugs to actually become the best and most beautiful and actualized potential self, you. And that's a pretty exciting story. So, um, that's Dr. Great. Bob. That's great. Uh, I, I, we didn't uh, rehearse this ahead of time, but I want to say how much I respect this morning uh, John and Pam are staying with Colleen and me, and it was moving to me to come down to see if you guys were up and that you were already sitting 
practicing, and I'm saying that out of respect to your talking about practice, that this isn't just theory. It really involves um, meditating before you come speak at Cal Southern. <laughs> so, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. So thank you. I ah. have much respect for that, and I, I love that balance. Maybe we can start by talking about uh, various elements of the map okay. and, and then move later into practical applications that also bridge into clinical uh, applications as well. How about if we start with uh, the quadrants? Are you, are you okay, and, and thank you for that first comment. Let me say something about that, yeah, and then we'll go yeah. back to the quadrants. Let's go for it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a practitioner, and no, I'm not an addict or an alcoholic, but my particular disease was chronic, life-crushing, suicidal depression, okay? My older brother committed suicide uh, in my home, and that began my journey into, I'd already had some experience with it, but into the depth that my brother was, so I got to take on his stuff, and um, it was really clear to me, and I wanted to die almost every day. I mean, I don't know if who's suffered from that kind of depression, but at that, you know, Robin Williams comes to mind. You know, we go, how could you do that? He was so talented and beautiful, so many gifts and all this stuff. Well, the suffering in this disease becomes so profound that the thought of continuing to be alive seems like hell, and the thought of annihilation and non-existence seems to be a total blessing. So I get that level of depression and suffering. So that was, that was what was going on with me. I'm working with my addicts and I'm trying to get this all together to help my beloved addicts and my students and the people I'm working with. And lo and behold, it's like, it's all coming back at me. So I began to uh, put this together and I discovered more on this as we go on, uh, brain entrainment meditation. And I, I was, uh, my master's degree is in transpersonal psychology. So spirituality and meditation and yoga, all these things were, I had dabbled in and knew they were important, but had a hard time kind of sticking with it. And then I discovered uh, this type of meditation that uses sound waves uh, using headphones to bring, and train your brain to deep uh, meditative states or very deep brainwave states, whatever is desired, however you adjust the, the audio tracks. So I said, you know, maybe this is the answer mm. to helping my brand new in recovery students to meditate. Because yeah. before, if I could get them to sit for 10 minutes was like a big deal. And I don't think it was meditation. You know, when is this going to be over? So I said, okay, this, this could be good for them. So I took it, I, I ordered it finally, a particular technology that was available then. And lo and behold, in the first week of using this, I was having this just really dramatic spiritual opening. You know, and I'm versed in the, in the, in the language of mysticism and spiritual experience and William James and Jung and, and all these guys. So I kind of knew what was going on. And I was like, wow, I'm like enlightened. In one week, pretty cool. Well, not so much, as you can probably tell. But what it did, it kind of expanded me. Uh, I had this larger context, and then the real work started. And I started going through layer after layer after layer of my own hurt and my own dysfunction and my own pain and trauma. <coughs> and being an educated, kind of smart therapist type, uh, I knew what my issues were. But let me just say, knowing what your issues are is like reading a menu. It's very useful, you know it's available, the price and everything, but if you just go around reading menus, you will starve to death if you never eat the food. So I began to do this, and there was no like material I didn't know was there, uh, but the stuff started coming, and what happened is it would, I, I had this kind of observer witness self that was kicking in, which kicks in very, very quickly with this type of uh, meditation technology, which sometimes takes many, many years of of traditional practice and sometimes doesn't happen at all, but it's, it's one of the goals of meditation. So I was able to kind of sit back one part of me and absolutely let this trauma and hurt churn out, express itself through my body somatically. Mm -hmm. And it would come and do its thing. And I learned that I couldn't listen to the messages on top. Could it be, oh, this is gonna kill you. You deserve this. If you, you'll get stuck and never get out, you know? So, okay, thank you. And I would stay with the sensations and, and just, Pam can remember seeing me, I mean, I'd meditate every day and I'd be, we'd be in motels, I'd be you know, just dealing with the agony that was just coming up. Mm -hmm. But it was just bodily sensations. It wasn't killing me, it was making me well. Mm -hmm. So I, pretty soon I realized, man, I'm, I'm finally getting, I'm cured. The depression is being cured. And I had done just about everything. They had me on a whole cocktail of, um, of drugs at one point and said I was gonna have to be it on the rest of my life. And, Eventually I was so ill I couldn't work, so you lose your insurance, and if you can't get insurance, you can't pay seven, eight hundred dollars for the medications, whatever it was. So anyway, 
that's, I went through the medication thing. And so this became a very, it, it, it really changed it from being kind of an out there third person, I wanna help you people uh, that I care about to, oh my God, this is healing my life. And so uh, some of my students have called me like the chief practitioner. So everything that I do and I talk and I preach, I do it daily. Um, mm -hmm. It's because it's, it's the practice that helps you negotiate the territory revealed by the map and that what's really grounding it. And we have a truism in integral recovery, and I'll get back to the quadrants, mm -hmm. is that good, it, you, know, you, don't, you don't relapse when you ingest the substance, you relapse when you stop practicing, okay? Because my students who stay with the practice, they make mm -hmm. it, you know? They, they stay with it and they have hard times and in, in, in some ways we even suffer more because we're open to it now, mm -hmm. and we realize suffering is, is, is our greatest teacher in many cases. And so, uh, Ken Wilber says we, we suffer more, but it bothers us less. So not only do we open to our own pain, but we begin to open to the pain of all our mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, you know, past, present, and the future, and mm -hmm. sentient beings, high pooch, and not just, not just humans, but all the other mm -hmm. co-inhabitants mm -hmm. in our beautiful planet. <laughs> so, so that's, um, what happened and, and then it became a very first person thing so I became much more and not just a theoretician but definitely a guide and a coach and that it's, it's a very personal thing and as, as Bob said you know I wouldn't dare be in front of all you pe beautiful people all over the world right now if I hadn't done my, uh, my meditation and I found that not only does the meditation and I'm using the, the, uh, the brain entrainment technology help me get through the things of the past but I find that in 24 hours yeah, there's just stuff that builds up. You know, you're on the freeway and somebody flips you off and honks and you, know, and you go on and this and that, or you, something horrible you're hearing on the radio or some tragedy in your own life or in your circles. And so you have all this stuff. And in the meditation process, you're able to just to feel it and release it. Feel it, release it. And under, under the release, and this is an important thing about the trauma work, is that once it's released, and, and it's usually just the, the mental messages, oh, this is terrible, your fault, whatever that might be, um, bracket that and stay with the bodily felt sensations and builds up intensifies and when it releases you feel peace you feel clearness mm -hmm. openness and often uh, after the release has happened there's an intuitive understanding a deeper understanding more compassionate wiser perhaps about what really happened and so you can kind of I tell don't uh, my students, don't listen to the stuff on the top but mm -hmm. after the release has happened you can kind of tap into that and that's one of the um, truly amazing things about the practice is that we begin to uh, tap into on a more regular basis our own intuitive wisdom voice and we can discriminate between you know your linear mind your beautiful human intellectual brain that can you know connect the dots and make the maps and think all these thoughts and do the equations and that voice is just that kind of intuitive knowing mm -hmm. and it's really great if you're a therapist or you're working with people or you're just a human being walking around the planet so the cultivation of accepting the pain and blessing it as a teacher because when it releases there's a lot of energy that is released and that energy is no longer uh, constellated in some kind of repression or something in the basement or something you project on others or some need to self-medicate and narcoticize yourself. But it's no more energy for being alive, for being um, creative, for being loving, for being happy, if you will. So, um, great. Back to the quadrants. <laughs> Let me get some more. Can I interject something here? You bet. I think this is gold, what you just shared with us. Um, thinking of how um, unusual it's been in my experience professionally or, and academically for people in our field to share from their hearts and from their um, histories, from their life experience. Uh, uh, I was just at this conference two weeks ago in Las Vegas where the keynote presenter, Patrick Carnes, uh, started off his presentation. He's uh, kind of the grandfather of sex addiction treatment here in the United States. And he started off his presentation by sharing similarly, sharing personally. And it was just riveting to a group of probably 400 people, uh, therapists primarily, to start with this premise that we're all in the soup together and to start with, with this kind of uh, in our front yard, native knowing. So I really bow to that, I really honor the sacredness of what you've shared. And it sets a model, I feel like, for the kind of uh, education that really works, uh, especially in this field. So I really honor you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the quadrants. Here we start with, oh my gosh, there we go. So you notice there's the X and there's a four quadrants. And basically these quadrants are essential dimensions that are present in every occasion, okay? 
However, if you neglect any of them, you don't have a full picture. And to be integral in any sense of the word, you really need to start with these four quadrants. And basically you go, what is integral? Well, another way of saying it's holism with the map. So instead of just the kind of the intuition that everything kind of fits together, you know, and this and that and that, well, that's very true. But this is how we can actually skillfully work with it. So in the upper left quadrant, the it space, and we say it, we mean it's an objective thing. So the way a doctor would look at your body as an objective uh, organism with uh, problems to be fixed. So that is the, the, the human body. And, and you can apply this to hamsters or anything, actually. But in, in the case for what we're talking about, we're talking about a human being suffering from the disease of addiction. So the upper left quadrant. Upper is, right. Up, I'm sorry. I'm left-handed. I always call it left, right, and right, left. <laughs> When I was in the army, I was like Gomer Pyle. They go march left, and I head off all by myself. <laughs> Dude, boy! <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, that's why I'm here, John, is to help you with the. That's right. That's <laughs> oh boy. So, upper right quadrant. Thank you. Uh, is um, the human body? So that's your your organs, your circulatory system, even your energetic body, the subtle body that Chinese medicine deals with. Uh, all of the stuff is included. And has that been damaged by, uh, by uh, drugs and alcohol and the disease of addiction? Yes, mm -hmm. because the science is very clear mm -hmm. that addiction and alcoholism can be, can be looked at and understood as a physical disease, okay? It's not because you're a sinner. It's not because you have an addictive personality. It's not because you're just lame. I mean, some of our best and brightest, again, Robin Williams. Uh, committed suicide, struggling with this disease of addiction, okay? And, all right, there we go. So, so, that, so when, when somebody comes in to see you and they're in the latter stages of addiction, they're coming in for treatment, are there issues going on in the physical body? Yes. The brain neurochemistry is all deleted and out of balance and drained. Uh, nutritional things, stress, the organisms have just been, no telling what they've been, maybe there's you know, all kinds of sex and uh, transmitted disease. Yeah, it's just a mess. And, and so there's a lot of stuff to be done there. So there's a lot of work uh, to be repaired in the upper right quadrant. And if you neglect that, you're not gonna get there. Yeah. And you know, AA and 12 steps, God bless it. It was the first word in, in the modern recovery movement, but doesn't do a lot with the body. You know, it was more of a, a group support, uh, spiritual, whatever it is, but this was really neglected. So very, very important. So we know, we know what's going on in the body. We check out what, what the individual client, student, patient, however you want to name that, and we start doing the work. And that includes nutrition, good food, healthy food, uh, green, clean, uh, excellent food, often... Uh, uh, supplements are needed because there's just such a deficit and just eating good food doesn't get you there quick enough. And of course the, the uh, exercise, this is all about um, um, uh, not just the meta inner, inner work, the contemplative work um, in the practice, which we'll talk about more, but it's about the physical work too, which includes strength training, uh, yoga, uh, cardio, and all kind of how you balance that out. And of course, as you become more of a master practitioner, you really develop more of your own program and you know how you know where to go. But in the beginning, I'm pretty, I don't give a bunch of choices. You know, come to the gym, work with me. And it's, it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's like in basic training in the military, they say, well, would you like to do bazookas today or machine guns? <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, you're gonna do this. So it's pretty directed at that point. So there's a lot going on with the body. And uh, it is a brain disease. We know the organ, we know the defect, and we know the symptoms. Bang, Western medicine, it's a disease. And why is that important? Well, some people will say, well, if you say it's a disease, it'll make people depressed because they're sick and they'll use more. I mean, people who are pretty far down the road in addiction, they, yeah, there is a stage of denial, but after a while, it's like pretty apparent. Yeah, I'm a heroin addict, I'm a, I'm a crackhead, I'm an alcoholic, it's all I wanna do, okay? So, and, and because of that, it has to be treated in our Western scientific world as a disease. And it has to be treated with compassion and energy and finances. And of course, with the new laws that are going through Congress now, they're requiring uh, insurance companies to cover addiction and mental disorders, depression, etc. which, thank you, it's been <laughs> killing millions of us. Now we're finally saying it's a, it's a real problem. It's really, it's progress, it's good. So, um, yeah, so that's the, the upper right quadrant. Very important. Now, uh, the upper left is the interiors of the individual, okay? So you have the physical body, but believe it or not, there's a lot going on inside of us, okay? And that's your thoughts, your, 
your beliefs, your loves, your hatreds, your prejudices, your meanings, your values, uh, your conditionings from when you were growing up, what happened to you from your traumas, from your successes, all of that stuff. Okay, and when you get somebody uh, just off the street into treatment, man, there's, you know, it's like, first of all, the fact you're in treatment means you're a loser, right? You failed, you can't do this yourself, you need help, you're, you're experiencing tremendous cravings, depression, fear, it's just a waste of my time, will my life ever be livable again, and all this stuff. So there's a lot of work, and, and of course, most people who uh, begin to self-medicate using drugs and alcohol or some combination thereof are doing it for a reason. There's something wrong. They don't feel good in their own skin. They're depressed. They're, they're anxious. They can't communicate with others or something. So you have to go back and actually work with all that stuff. The stuff that's been created by the addiction itself but the stuff that was there that got people using in the first place. Because if you don't go back there, the likelihood of continued sobriety and this upward uh, movement of your life is not so good. So that's the, the upper left. And how do we deal with the upper left? Well, we have a, a very effective interior practice facilitated by this uh, brain entrainment technology, okay, that actually puts people in these deep meditative states that would have taken people many, many years of uh, daily even, uh, monastic type of discipline, several hours a day, to even tap into those brainwave states just for a little while in most cases, and this stuff takes you there, the desired brainwave states immediately and keeps you down there. So people begin to feel the power of the meditation and they begin to see the results and feel the results in the first week or two in, in treatment or for those of us who are not, not addicts just using this. And it, it begins to inspire hope that change can happen. Yes, I can get better. Oh my gosh, you know, things are going on. And, the, and they're able to kind of stand outside of the drama for a little while and develop this witness observer self that allows them to kind of go, Oh yeah, not so good. You know, this is the story I've been operating on, or this is what I've been believing, and it's like it's just no. I think I need to to let go of that one and come up with a a new story, a new a new version of my life that's more optimal and more positive, and and it takes me somewhere out of this dark pit that I've fallen into. So down in the lower left, and notice that uh, well that this side, the the uh, the left side of the quadrants is all interiors, okay, and I c I couldn't take. For example, your love uh, for your partner, uh, your love for your music, your love for your work, your profession, or your dog, or, or your hatred for that matter, and put it in a test tube and go, oh, you know, here's a, Bob, here's your love, you know. Uh, it's not like that. Now, you could take, uh, with all the brain scans and all the technology we have about neurochemical and different parts of the brains that fire, and the blood goes here, and the energy goes there, and what organs are, you know, what parts are working together, we can say, oh, people who fall in love, this stuff, and there's a commonality of what we see going on in the human brain, but that tells us absolutely nothing about what's going on inside. Okay, you, you see this brain with a bunch of things, and so well, it doesn't tell me anything about his experience or her experience. All right. So how do you not have to, to find out about love? Well, you got to fall in love, right? Or you have to listen to the Beatles songs. Or you have to leave, you know, Shakespeare's sonnets or, you know, watch movies, chick flicks. Love movies. Anyway, so to get the real feeling of, of what love's about. So, uh, yeah, so down here, the we space, okay, this is the space between us. It's cultural, it's relational. Uh, it starts with your partner, your children, your family, your colleagues, uh, your nation, your people. Uh, I mean, the, the circles can get bigger and bigger. But in the progression of the disease of addiction, and it is, by the way, a progressive disease, some of the, the, the qualities of addiction, it, it starts out here and goes down devolutionary, getting worse and worse over time. And in that progress, in the beginning, it's something you can, you know, you have a drink. Uh, most alcoholics uh, say they can remember their first drink. It was like, you know, they had this great rush of serotonin and dopamine, they felt great, and, and, and it goes down from there. Um, but in the progress of the disease, you, uh, one, one of the signs that you have an alcoholic or an addict on your hands is there's a radical change in personality from the formerly okay dad or a good enough mom or good enough brother, sister, whatever that would, they turn into this manipulative, psychopathic creature that just really, uh, like Gollum, and I think we have a slide of that here in, in the Lord of the Rings movie, that brilliant characterization of, you know, the addict to the ring and the power, and he would, he would go back and forth from his human or hobbit self, wanting to, to love uh, Frodo, and then, then, oh, my precious, and I mean, it's like, 
addiction. <laughs> so um, there, there he is. Yeah, you see, oh, I've hurt people. I don't care. I just want it, you know. So, um, so there's a lot of repair work to be done. A lot of betrayal, a lot of violence or stealing or lying or all this kind of stuff that goes on in the, in the process uh, of addiction. And also there's, there's, you need to build new communities and new support, okay? Because, uh, you know, in the drug world, there's quite a bit of support. You have your other addicts and you have your whole kind of underworld of users and stuff. And eventually that kind of falls away and it's just the individual struggling to get more of the substance and doing what he has to do. Um, so there's a lot of work, a lot of repair work, uh, family work, therapy work. And by the way, when I'm working with families, it's not just the identified patient or the addict who gets the biz or gets the treatment, it's the whole family. So I get everybody doing the practices and the meditation and teaching them the model and the techniques and technologies that go in this because we all suffer, okay? It's not just the, the addict. If we've been in a relationship with an addict, there's been pain and hurt and suffering. So we get everybody doing this. More about that later. So in the lower right quadrant, it's simply the out there of the rest of the world, the objective reality. And that includes uh, finances, buildings, uh, food, clothing, changing the oil in your car, education, you know, all that stuff. The legal system. What's that? The legal system. The legal system, which is often an issue, more often than not. And um, so that has to be dealt with also. So, and, and there's been damage done there. You know, the guy's used all his, you know, his kid's education fund, the mortgage of the house to buy drugs, his inheritance, the, whatever it is, it's, it's just been shot. And bills haven't been paid, and there's debts, and there's court orders, and there's all kind of things building up. So this really needs to be uh, the, oh, that was a good one, uh, the, my world. That has to be uh, start uh, to fix. And in our little thing that we did in our home, my assistant Heidi Mitchell would be kind of the lower right person. She would get the students, and they would write the letter to the judge. I, your Honor, I really, I'm in treatment right now and I need to be here and I can't be there on the 21st. And, and oh, by the way, here's $50 to pay back. You know, and there's, sometimes it's huge the amount of damage, but just taking that first step engenders, wow, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but we're starting to, to move in that direction. So all of these, uh, and you know, you can look at this, and of course, Pam, she did this, I, I think it's really great. The upper left, uh, upper right, rather, my body. Upper left, myself, my interior, the Buddha self, the deepest self, my, my uh, people, that's Pam and myself on the day we got married, by the way, and my world, and that's the planet we were married on. No, so that's the, uh, the uh, lower right. So you have to put this all together. And if you're going to be holistic in any workable sense, all of this stuff has to be accounted for. And normally we will focus as therapists or healers or on, on the quadrant that we're the most comfortable in. Yes. So if you're a medical doctor, you'll be, you know, hopefully, I mean, that's a whole nother, there's not a lot of education that goes on about addiction and alcoholism in medical schools across the world, as far as I can see in my travels and my speaking. And I went, I was in a Boulder, Colorado recently for something and a young Swedish doctor approached me and he says, I'm a doctor. I said, well, that's great. Congratulations. He says, and you're not. That's true also. Uh, I said, but I had to read your book to learn about addiction. Mm -hmm. That's not right. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really a, uh, a mystery, a question. Why are our doctors are not being taught and our healthcare professionals more about this disease that just shows up everywhere? And they say in the United States, in the general population, about 10% of us have this capacity or this ism. So it is all of us. And in certain ethnic groups on uh, Indian reservations, for example, sometimes it's up to 90% drug addiction, alcohol, and just devastating. Yeah. Millions of our brothers and sisters all over the world and our medical professionals aren't learning anything about it. Unbelievable, I don't get it, but anyway. Um, yeah, so, so all of this has to be included. And just because you're really good uh, at the um, upper right, doesn't mean you can ignore all the other things. So either you're gonna to have to get good in it or find other individuals who can have that covered in your treatment team. So all of this stuff has to be put together. And anything, any stresses or any damage in any uh, one of the quadrants will cause stress and hurt in all the other quadrants. On the other hand, anything good that you do 
uh, that, that those amends you make uh, relationally, those, those bills you start to pay back, uh, the, the working through your trauma in the upper left and getting your body back in shape will actually begin to cause good things and, and uh, uh, influence the other quadrants. And really it's all one, but in a certain way we need to, um, to, to separate them so they can have their clear attention. And when you get down to it, you can't reduce a physical body to an interior life, even though reductionist psychologists have tried to do it, I don't think it's been done very successfully. So, Bob, do you have any comments I wanna, on that? I want to just dive in and respond real briefly and then maybe talk about uh, levels. Um, uh, Plato uh, called it the part whole error, where, where it's inside of us as humans to mistake uh, a single part for the whole. And uh, I've run into this professionally, you've run into it, you're talking about it, and many of us in this room know about this. Uh, there's just something inside of us that wants to uh, reduce down the complexity of the world to my little, my, little, my little quadrant, to use this language. And so if you were to take away one piece today, I think, as people in this field or knowing people in this field, it would be to bring this kind of multi-perspective uh, sensibility to, to the work because it's, uh, it's one thing to look at a map and it's very appealing and it's uh, 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 so much truth to it. But in practice, this isn't being implemented generally in our field writ large, not just in addiction and recovery, but also in the fields of psychology, psychotherapy, counseling, etc. cetera. Uh, my father was a biologically oriented psychiatrist, so I grew up with the upper right-hand quadrant being the lingua franca of my household. And so I have real personal feeling for how this goes. If you spend that much time studying something, pretty same, so what did Maslow say pretty soon? Every what is it about the nail and the hammer? Yeah, If everything looks like a nail, all problems look like a nail. Say it again. If all you have is a hammer, suddenly all problems look like a nail. Thank you. So if if everything is if for me is one quarter or another, then I just that's what I do is I just slam that into whatever. So um, if you can take this and reflect on this, I think this would be a gift you could bring from this presentation, just, the, just what we've just shared here. You can see uh, how this manifests in our profession and then the toll that it takes. P lives are lost. Yeah. Lives are lost over this kind of part whole error. It's not some academic thing. It manifests really in terms of professional practice. So yeah, and, and integral thing, we say that people are generally correct in what they affirm. Okay, and, and that's what we find in the recovery world, you know, the different, you know, this is a yoga recovery place, this is a 12-step one, this is, you know, rational recovery or whatever it might be. They, they really have good points to make, but we tend to err in what we neglect. Yeah, that's so, there can, you know, you can be, this part of the diet can be just super cool, <laughs> but the other two miles are just, you know, not together at all. The whole, you know, ocean's just going to, it's not going to be a successful diet. So you need to, to include that, okay, and, and begin to think about what you're good at and what you're not and how you need to fill in those pictures. And you can walk into this room and go, okay, uh, my physical body, how are you doing? Well, I'm 58 and I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, two days ago I played tennis and I worked out a bunch and I was traveling and hadn't got to the gym yet, so I can kind of access, I probably need to get to the gym today. That kind of thing. How am I doing in my interiors? Well, I'm really excited, a little bit nervous about talking with all these beautiful people in this room and all over the world. And so I can check in with that. Do I feel like I'm, you know, kind of on online with my task and my vocation and what I'm supposed to be doing in the world? Check. You know, absolutely. So there's that. Um, and uh, that, so that's the, the upper left and upper right individual. And then we have the, the interiors, you know, where, where are people at in this room? Are people excited? Are people bored? Is this a class they have to go to in order to get their degree, which they're gonna get in a few weeks and they just wanna get out of here? Or whatever that thing is. Or when we'll start talking about level stage, the spiral dynamics, we'll go, well, is this a, you know, a green audience, an orange, blue, red? So that really will influence how I will, hopefully, <laughs> if I'm being skillful, how I will present to the group. Yeah. So there's that stuff going on. And then, you know, in the uh, uh, lower right, I mean, it, you know, the windows are broken out and all we hear is, you know, cars and it's starting to rain. I mean, and there's no chairs or it's a beautiful environment such as this. Cool. Covered. So you just kind of can make this scan almost automatically. It's like you, uh, I think Ken is like downloading an operating system. So after a while, you don't have to consciously do it. You just kind of are scanning that and bringing mindfulness and awareness to the, the, the quadrants. So, thank you. That's a lot about quadrants. That's good. You mentioned spiral dynamics. Pray tell. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, let, let's let me let me do lines first. Okay, you I do whatever you want right. to. We're so, gonna do lines first, y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, <laughs> 
So what are lines, you may ask? Well, I know what you know what lines are. But in the terms of, um, of uh, the integral or the aqua map, lines represent individual intelligences. Okay? So it used to be in, in our Western world here that there was one line that was really measured, and that's IQ. Yeah. And if you had like 160, 70, 80, you get an MIT, Harvard, Princeton, the good schools, you get these big checks. And it didn't necessarily mean you were going to accomplish anything at all, but you, that was what we measured. Well, back, I think it was Goldman in the 80s started saying there's an emotional intelligence. And actually, emotional intelligence has a lot more to do with how someone will actually be successful throughout the, the span of their lives. So how they relate to others and their own emotions and stuff like that. So we had two lines. Then we took it from there and we just, well, there's multiple lines. And I think it's really understandable. We have many intelligences. Mm -hmm. Like this guy over here is a great cameraman. Okay, does 3D photography and everything. Put me in front of a camera. I don't even know what end to look in. So obviously, Bruce, your your camera uh, line is much more developed than mine. And so you can have culinary. This guy's a great drummer. We've got the drummer <laughs> line, different capacities. So that's all well and good. And not everybody needs to do everything. I mean, you could be a really lousy drummer and have a great life. Okay, but we found that there's four basic lines that we call self-related lines. That if there is too much deficit and any one of these is going to cause the whole self system to be out of balance and to go down uh, hill. And the first one is the good old cognitive line. And so I know we say lines and we kind of look at them as going uh, up vertically because you can kind of measure them. You know, it's, oh, the physical, this guy's an athlete. He's in great shape. It's really high. Oh, cognitively, he's dumb as a stump, you know, or, you know, he's really <laughs> ignorant or something. He didn't go to school or whatever. Um, so, you know, you have this thing here. So you have a, whoa. All right. Lines of development over here. Uh, Ken Wilber said one time this map looked like somebody ate a box of crayons and threw up on a piece of paper. So <laughs> it, I know it's kind of complicated. Let's, yeah, anyway. So you have, the, you have the physical line, which we talked about. So that line has, and these four lines are the essential parts that make up integral practice. So you have to look at these four lines, these four capacities, which I'll enumerate. There it is again. And you have to work on them ongoing for the rest of your life. And it's not as complicated as it seems, but it's not easy, especially in the beginning stages when you're not used to doing it. Just like any new skill, if you pick up a guitar, and you're not going to sound like Hendrix in any way, shape, or form in your first two weeks, maybe your whole life, who knows. But you have to start off as a beginner. Same thing with practice, these practices. So you have to work on the physical line. We get people in the gym, we do yoga, uh, we do cardio, um, nutrition, supplements, etc. cetera. Uh, the cognitive line, of course, I mean, the human mind is just an amazing thing. And if you, uh, you feed it good things, it's going to function in a much more healthy level. And there's a little story that's one of the teaching stories foundational to this thing, uh, integral recovery. And in this story, there's a young man, and he has this dream, and there's these two dogs in the dream. And one is like this evil-looking, mangy, junkyard, big old, slobbering, spike-collar dog. And there's this beautiful, noble, you know, Rin Tin Tin, whatever, type dog. Uh, and they're just like going after one another. And he wakes up and he's, he's like, oh my God, he's shot. And this version of the story has a Native American elder who's his, his, his um, elder. And he goes, grandfather, I had this dream of these two dogs fighting. And it was really disturbing. And I don't know what it means, but it's, it was really powerful. And, and the a medicine man says, grandson, he says, don't worry about it. And he probably had a different accent. Grandson, don't worry about it. Anyway, uh, he says the... The evil looking dog is your evil nature or your addict nature in, 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 in our particular case. And the healthy dog is your good self. He says, but grandson, don't worry. The good dog will win. And he goes, well, okay, I get it. But grandfather, how can you say that? He says, because you're going to feed the good dog. So you can really just kind of mythically or intuitively or in a story way understand the importance of the practice that's when you feed the good dog okay because if you're an addict in the latter progressions of the disease you're getting your butt kicked your universe destroyed by this bad dog and it's time to start starving this pup over here and start paying attention to this good dog so that's what the the lines show us what what parts need to be worked on okay the emotional line that is your inner emotional life, the stuff 
the traumas, the bad things that happen to you. Everybody who's born at this stage has had stuff happen. We've suffered. Um, it can be the conditionings, the stories you were given when you were growing up. I mean, it could be really good in some cases, but in a lot of cases not. Uh, all of that stuff, the trauma that happens uh, from moment to moment. Sometimes it's even future stuff. The imminent demise of yourself and everyone you love. We die, okay? Just dealing with that existential reality can also be very painful stuff. So in the emotional line, this is an interior practice and doing the meditation and using this brain entrainment technology, which really has an incredible capacity to integrate the mind, the body, and the emotions. Whereas in, often in traditional meditation, it's, it's kind of a, a dissociated, you know, you, can, you kind of see it, but you're not really connected to it. This stuff really does connect and allows you, as I was saying earlier in my own work, getting over my depression or getting through my depression, is it just has to be released somatically. And this technology does that wonderfully. And the spiritual line is uh, spirituality. It's, 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 it's a huge... Uh, area. Uh, some of the definitions you can say, uh, spirituality involves the great existential questions about reality, right? Why does something exist rather than nothing? Uh, is there a God or is there an intelligence here? Or is it just kind of some random chemical thing, uh, you know, the pool of chemicals and lightning bolt, and dum, 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 you know, and it all started from there? Or is there something actually going on here? Uh, is there any kind of awareness or anything after death you know do we just die and the lights go out and that's it you know what are these you know big heavy questions it also is about essences and um, going into the deepest part of yourself and one of the really really great things that, that I have reaffirmed and in the great spiritual traditions is that your deepest self is your best self it's your most profound self in, in Hindu they say Atman is Brahman and Brahman is Atman Brahman being the all everything, the, the intelligent presence that is the universe and universes, and Atman being the deepest part of yourself, you might say, in more Western, your own soul. And when you get down to those depth, your deepest part of yourself is none other than everything else. And so depression, addiction is a process of constant, uh, deeper and deeper alienation. You're more lonely, you're more caught off, you're out of the mainstream, you look at people who have cars and lives and families and go, who are these people, but I need drugs. And, and depression the same way. You don't even feel you can function in the world. You get more and more isolated. So, so anyway, the, 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 the spiritual line, is not, it's not a dogmatic thing. We, I do not pr promote Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Taoism or Native American stuff, although I'm influenced by all of those. But it is a, it's a deep inner exploration in your own deepest essence. And then you can language it in any way you want it and you can attach yourself to any tradition that you will and it's, it's all very good but it's a deep practice and that's where we we get to some of the deepest hurt and the deepest human issues that are often covered up uh, or we we consciously or unconsciously are using drugs not to have to deal with this and so at some point we have to do we have to do with that and we can really redeem our hurt and our pain and the suffering of the world in our own spiritual practice and I was on a panel once and somebody asked me, well, what is God to you? And I was like, oh, God, what a question. God, what a question. Um, and <laughs> the answer, kind of the transpersonal cliche is, well, that which can be named God is not God, because God is beyond all concepts and blah. You know, it's like, yeah, that's true, but, you know. But anyway, what came up in the moment, and I just went, wow, and everybody kind of went, wow, is that God is the light that I find in the darkness. Okay, mm -hmm. so God is the light and the meaning and the significance and the compassion and the wisdom and the understanding that we find in the deepest parts of our human despair and suffering. Mm -hmm. And why is that good? Because addicts are on a fast train to get there. Uh, some of, you know, we're all, we all kind of have to deal with that, but addicts are pushed because of the, the rapid progression of the disease into that place. So it's a really good place to start. So those are the, uh, those are the, the four lines and the basic practices. So what does this mean like in reality? Well, in my case, I meditate an hour a day because I found that's what I need. And people say, well, John, why do you meditate so much? Because I was really screwed up. <laughs> I need a lot of help. Some people may be able to do it on 20 minutes. So, But in, in my retreats that I work with addicts, we, we would do an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening which is like amazing. I couldn't get them to do 10 minutes before. Now I got these guys right off the streets, 
uh, meditating for an hour a day. And they're not like in perfect meditation pose. Sometimes they're all laid out on the cushions. But after a week or two, they, they, they begin to come alive again. It's quite amazing. So, yeah, you, you need an interior, effective interior practice. And we have technologies that will facilitate that practice. And in no way negates the techniques and the wisdom of the wisdom traditions from the past that's been going on for thousands of years. But it really brings it, makes it much more powerful and much more accessible to the majority of us. So it takes deep, uh, meditative, contemplative, interior practice and democratizes the process. So most of us can get there pretty quickly, whereas before maybe there were one or two, you know, masters in each tradition or something that would show up on the planet and the rest of us kind of hang on their, their spiritual coattails. So there's just an interior noticing, mindfulness, releasing. This interior work is very vast and there's a lot of stuff to it and uh, it's in the book and I continue to develop it. So those are the four lines. Oh, in the practice, yeah, you just got to work out. You got to be a lifetime athlete. You got to push yourself just about every day to your 10. And then what's your 10? It's like, <sighs> you're, 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 you're breathing and you're sweating and you can't talk. So even if you do that, just get there for a minute. It's going to kick you in and it just does all kinds of wonderful things uh, to the body. And it sends all this message and understanding throughout the body. Hey, this guy wants to be alive. Let's all show up and do our job. It's great with depression, neurochemical balance, on and on. There's a great book I'm reading right now. I'm almost finished called Spark. It's getting a lot of press, and a medical doctor just takes all the research, not all of it, but a lot of it, uh, research on, on the benefits of, of exercise and applies it to ADHD, depression, addiction, all kinds of disorders, mm -hmm. and it's just overwhelming. And when you read it, you go, okay, I really get it. But it's, it's a very inspiring book, and it's, it's transformational. And you start feeling alive again, and their hope is engendered. Instead of taking drugs, the message is, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, I suck, I deserve to die. You work out and it's like, hey, getting there, you know, I'm on the road. So, uh, so yeah, so you have to work out, you got to eat the right kind of stuff and you have to have an ongoing interior practice. And because of the, um, um, the, um, uh, the nature of technology, can I, can I see my phone or your phone? Your phone is newer, cooler. Anyway, so, so you can, you know, I've got 64 gigs of memory on this thing, and so I can have my meditation tracks here. And when I was flying on the two different flights from Texas to Salt Lake to Southern California, mm -hmm. you know, I meditated about four hours that day. So instead of just having a, a bad seat, you know, I had a, you know, a spiritual retreat. And so it's just an ongoing practice for me. And uh, it works in so many levels of creativity greatly enhanced. If you're a student, cognitive function is enhanced. You can study more, you can focus more, you can begin to what real intelligence is when you connect the dots and see how things fit together in creative new ways. When I was writing the book, my old messages about myself were, you know, I'm kind of a dummy and I can't write and I'm this and what can I accomplish and I'm getting too old and stuff. So I do my meditation, I have my legal pad, my prop, a legal, this is not an illegal pad, I promise. Um, legal pad and I would jot down the notes for the day and that would become the seeds of my writing for that day mm -hmm. and I just uh, I really trust the process at this point that the flow is going to be there and and I could still be writing that book you know but at some point you had to say no this is this is enough for this particular volume so uh, that is also enhanced in the practice and, and when the mind begins to function, the brain begins to function and evolve steadily into higher uh, levels of organization and functioning, it changes everything. Whether you're cooking or you're, you're loving or you're writing or you're doing sports, athletics, uh, the game changes, working out. Really extraordinary. So, what was the next thing? Levels? Let's continue on, my friend. <coughs> okay. Levels. Yeah. All right. Oh, spirals. Okay, Marvin. All right. We're good. So, may I? Yeah. Okay. So, this is a model that I use, and it is uh, the original creator of a guy named Dr. Claire Graves, a psychology professor, and he did a lot of work on this in the 70s and the 80s. I believe he died in the early 90s or late 80s, I think. And then his book, he never wrote the book, but his notes and his papers and all this stuff was taken over by Don Beck and Cohen, and they wrote a book on spiral dynamics, and it's just taken off from there. And matter of fact, there's a gentleman who is, uh, works with on Beck, who's <coughs> getting older now. I don't know if he does that much teaching and speaking anymore, but he's kind of taking over for him or working with him. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, publishing a book of applications of spiral dynamics in the world. And he had 800 pages 
And then he found my book. And he was going, oh, no. I said, this is really good. This is probably one of the clearest uh, uses of this thing. And so anyway, the, the book's about 900 pages now. So he might have to like do volume one, volume two, volume three. So basically, while spiral dynamics, and there's many developmental models, Ken Wilber wrote a book called Integral Psychology. And in the back, he has like 130 <laughs> developmental maps all lined up. So you can see they all follow the same basic trajectory that it goes from simple to more complex as you move up and uh, just as you we develop you know there you wouldn't think of making a six-week-old infant uh, airborne ranger and putting a pack on him throwing him out of an airplane you probably wouldn't do, want to do that with many people but anyway so it's obvious if you look at things that we we move from uh, very dependent and very beautiful to you know much more uh, higher levels of capacity and not only does this um, look at the individual growth of, of individuals, but it also kind of traces the moral development of us as a species, which is really fascinating. So you can really look at, at human history, and then you can look at the world in general, in our country specifically, and see how, you know, why there's conflicts, because we have different people coming from different levels of development, and each level of development has its own thing that it thinks is important. And often it thinks that the other guy's stuff is nonsense, which is the early part of this story. So, and why is a developmental map uh, so essential or so revelatory in the field of, of addiction studies and, and treatment? Anyway, so say, and this is orange, and he, he, this has been uh, color-coded because Don Beck, uh, who was a, a, he was a professor at a, a university in Texas, and he went to South Africa when the transition was being made from democracy or from apartheid type of dictatorship to a democracy. And they really used this model to help them understand because you learn at different levels, people understand different languages, and you have to uh, talk to people in different ways. And it took it out of the racist thing. So if you had uh, a black guy and a, and a white guy, and the guy, they were both at the orange level, they could really understand each other. But if you have, you know, a white guy's here and the, or the black guy's here, you're going to have this, there's going to be all kinds of problems. So they really use this uh, in the real world at a, at a really ancient and difficult problem and really made a lot of progress in, in, in using this particular model. So Don did some great work and learned a lot. <clears throat> so, so in, in, and just in the case of addiction, why is this important? Because prior to this, it's kind of analog. It's not sober, not sober, okay? With, with our, and what we find is that if, if a person, the onset of uh, the disease is say at orange, and this is kind of modernistic level of capitalism in the United States and democracy and freedom and, and a lot of good stuff. Well, once the disease kicks in, there is a devolutionary a spiral down into lower states of development until where it's just a very a pathological egocentric and nobody matters except me and my drugs and getting high. And after a while, it's a, I don't even matter, just the high. And so you see this real, real, this progression of, of lack of morals, lack of ethics, criminal behaviors. And when people get in recovery and start doing the work, you can see very quickly as their minds clear up, as they begin doing the, the inner work and the process and the exterior work and the group work, et cetera, that, that they can quickly regain their former high ground you know, within a month or two. And then if they keep doing the work, many of us seem to be able to move quite quickly into these higher levels. And why is that important? Because almost all of our problems facing us today are world-centric, okay? And so we're coming from an ethnocentric place. You know, it's like my tribe against your tribe and this and that. It just doesn't work. It's just constant conflict, and we see that going all over the planet. So it's, it's important to get... Also, one of the insights that Ken uh, brought which is really good to this, is that different lines, remember the four essential lines, can be at different developmental levels. And it can get really, you can be, um, Ken often said that Nazi scientists could be really, really smart in, in a cognitive line and have the, you know, the ethics of an amoeba. You know, so if you have too much discrepancy between the different lines, you have super pathology and it can actually get quite dangerous. So you want to make sure you have integral growth going on. So you're not just this brilliant spiritual guy that sits on the couch and eats Twinkies and drinks Coke all day. 
and inflates. You know, you're not going to really be able to give your gifts to the world if you don't have a vehicle that's strong and viable enough to get around and do your work. So you see how these things kind of work together. Um, should I really launch into this? I'd love for you to do that. Okay. Okay, we're good. So down the first the first color is beige, and that's these are these colors are just sometimes they seem to really make a lot of sense, other times they're just there. Um, and beige is uh, zero to eighteen months. It's a level of the infant, and it's a very primitive level. And our, probably our ancestors were there a hundred thousand years ago, two hundred, three hundred. They keep kind of when human became human. When Homo sapien became Homo Homo sapien, you know it keeps pushed back with all the, the new digging and the anthropology they're doing. But it's it's um, it's a pretty early level of, of of development, and we're probably in little survival bands, you know, living in trees or caves or something like that. And you don't take like a six-week-old infant and go, "Oh, you selfish baby." <laughs> selfish baby. This doesn't doesn't imply. Those moral uh, strictures don't even apply at this age. So this is pretty early on. And you might see this in addiction with, you know, when the addict's living in a cardboard box in an alley in some major city and just coming out to try to scrounge and get a bottle of wine or something like that. And uh, next came on about 50,000 years ago, and you begin to see the artifacts with this, with the, the cave paintings in France, with the shaman, beautiful shamanistic pictures and the, all this stuff. And, and that's about 50,000 years ago. And at this point, shamanism, connection with the spirits of the land, uh, tribal organization came together. It was very uh, kind of community, tribally oriented. Uh, a little after that, about 10,000 years ago, red showed up, and red is very egocentric. Mm, me want? Pretty white. Mm, you dead, me get wife. <laughs> that kind of thing. And very power oriented. You can see it in the Vikings. You can see it in the, the gods of Mesoamerican, Greco Roman, Nordic gods. There wasn't a sense of an all compassionate, wise spirit that moved through everything. It was a bunch of superheroes with bad attitudes who would mess with you, and you kind of had to, you know, suck up. So, and obviously this brought um, a lot of problems, and red is a good color for it because it's bloody, it's violent. And big groups of organized people with a strong man can move into another area and enslave or eradicate people and take over the lands and all of this stuff. So what emerged about 5,000 years ago, and in theology they call it the Axial Age, when the great spiritual teachers, the Buddha, the, the Vedic uh, sages in, in India, uh, Christianity, obviously Judaism, the Mosaic teachings, the Old Testament, and probably ended up with uh, uh, Muhammad and Islam. And things really started shifting. They started saying, oh, this bloody way of just, you know, is not so good. There's, there's a creator, there's a spirit, there's something. You're not the center of the universe, old red. God is, or Allah is, or Jehovah, however you want to say that. And there's certain rules, and there's a teaching, there's a prophet, and you behave and do this and fit into the community. And this is huge moral leap from just rape and pillage and, and all this stuff going on here. However, there's some problems because at that level, there's only one truth. So if I'm a good old Christian guy, and you guys are the, you know, the infidel heretic Muslims, well, you're not, quite, you're not part of the, the chosen people, the inner sanctum, if you will. Therefore, I can slaughter and wreck you and vice versa. And so, obviously, it's still carrying on today in some parts of the world where we have this religious conflict. But it was a big move. And this is usually you know, seven to eight years old. And this is mythic awareness. The, the, the yardstick of truth is not science. It's not experiments, it's not mathematics, it's not rationality, it's not all that stuff. It's pre-rational. So we know truth by the revealed truth that comes through the scriptures or the teachers and the miracles and, and the, the stories and all this stuff. And that's what that leads things. And they say that, that the, the beginning shift between blue and red in the West, or at least in Europe, began with... Uh, different waves of, of the Black Death and, and the plagues. And it happened several times. And depending who you read, up to 50% of the population, or perhaps more, died of these plagues. And at that point, the bones of saints and the popes and the bishops and this and that, it wouldn't do any good. Everybody's dying, you know. And, and actually, uh, there was a superstition at Blue that cats were the consorts of uh, devils. And, um, of course, the cats were keeping down the rat population that were carrying the fleas that were, you know, bubonic plague came from. And so if they wiped out because of the superstitions of blue, 
it gave rise to more and more rats and more and more fleas and more and more death. So at this point, they did the kind of Sergeant Friday move. It was like, just the facts, man. All right, that's, that's science. They said, okay, no more with the stories and this and that. Let's start looking world scientifically. And as we all know, in the early Renaissance, there was a complete, a real breakdown and, and competition between uh, science and uh, the Catholic Church in this case. With, you would look through the telescope and see planets. And by the way, you know, the Earth is revolving. No, you don't like? Okay, I will shut up. Yes. Yes, barbecuing me is not a good idea. I'll be quiet. So anyway, so that was stuff. And then this became to be dominant in the West. And Orange, the rena Renaissance, um, uh, the individual, uh, science, the whole uh, American experiment, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence are very powerful flowerings of this orange um, modernistic shift where the individual is important, individual rights. It's not about the group anymore. It's about what we can accomplish. And a lot of really groovy things came from this. I mean, modern science, the fact I'm 58 years old, I still have all my teeth. I'm able to move and groove. They, I read recently that antibiotics, uh, given the average, on average in the Western world, 30 more years to be alive. Wow. It's that little thing, you know, and we bag on antibiotics a lot because now they're in the milk and everything. But on the other side, 30 years is a long time to do a lot of stuff. So um, and each notice that each of these levels of development come online when the older levels are not meeting the current needs. There's just the bloody stuff going on here. That's not a cool way to live. So we need teachers to teach us about compassion, about rules and order, humility, etc. Uh, we need something to take us beyond the mythic, uh, superstitious way of looking uh, at reality. So science and uh, great accomplishments. Also, we notice that there's a these things keep on coming online quicker and quicker. I mean, from beige, it was like 100,000 years. Till you know, then 50,000 years, then, then 10,000 years, 5,000 years, 300 years to the present with green and, and further. And there's also a um, kind of a, a, a shift between uh, the collective and the individual. So the red is all about me, power, what I want, instant gratification. Then you have the rule, it's the sangha, it's the church, it's the body of believers. And then orange comes on, which is the, the dignity of the individual again. And then, rather recently, uh, probably in the late 50s in the United States, green started being a major player. And green came online because good old orange capitalistic democracy was not meeting a lot of, of, of the challenges that were developing in the world. Poverty, for example, when you have a philosophy that says, hey, if you're smart and you work hard and you're born in the right family, you get the goodies. Sorry about you. You know, that doesn't set up the kind of uh, even emotional or spiritual um, uh, capacity where you can really start looking how do we all get included here mm -hmm. so um, uh, green emerged and green is very inclusive I mean uh, orange gets that but they get it kind of in a light intellectual way not in a deeply heartfelt compassionate complete way so with the advent of the civil rights movement in the United States uh, women's rights animal rights native rights Everybody right, gay rights, everybody's invited, everybody's included, okay? Uh, there's a beautiful inclusiveness, uh, 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 a love and an honoring of diversity, okay? So if you get somebody coming from blue and they go to San Francisco and they go, oh my God, there's Mexicans and black people and Chinese people and that's oh, the end of civilization and oh, it's like the Roman Empire. And like, what? You get somebody green, they go, this is the most beautiful, diverse, cool place on the earth. I love it here. So, you know, it just shows you a little of the, and, it, and, it, 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 and you begin to understand culture wars. These people aren't bad, they're just coming from different levels. So green is really cool, has a lot of stuff. It's become really mainstream, you know, Whole Foods, and, and yes, most of us believe in, in protecting the environment. Uh, majority, I would say, a lot of us still don't, but we do. So there's a lot of good stuff green. However, because green is a reaction against orange, often it becomes kind of anti-intellectual. Yeah. And I grew up, I spent about 20 something years in green. And it's like you have a green meeting, if everybody gets to express their opinions, it's a cool meeting, you know? Or their feelings, more than opinions. And, but you don't get much work done, you know? So there's, there's you, you kind of need to put these things together. So this is where the story really gets interesting. And I'm, I'm just going over, you know, all of human history in like 15 minutes here. So obviously, You're doing great, major, major broad strokes. <laughs> so 
Um, Spiral on. Right. <laughs> at, 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 at a certain stage, Claire Graves, the guy that, that came up with this stuff originally, started saying he, he noticed something really radical was happening. And he says it wasn't just a, you know, another uh, turn in the spiral, but he says there's this major, and he calls all of this first tier, this green down to beige, and he said there's a second tier emerging. And he says between this first tier and second tier, there's this huge gulf of meaning that's crossed. Okay, and let me explain to you what um, uh, second tier is, or we call it the integral self, or integral awareness. And it starts off with yellow and turquoise, and anyway, I won't get into all the specifics there. But one of the problems at first tier is every level thinks it's absolutely right, and everybody is absolutely wrong. Yeah. So, go home for the holidays, and if you're like a lot of American families, you're sitting there eating the turkey, and you don't want to talk about politics, religion, uh, football, anybody in the green? Going, football's so violent, <laughs> stupid. You know, and anyway, so they're just like, um, this is just great. You know, and they go, uh, let's pray. I don't pray, I meditate, okay? It's like, ah, so there's all kinds of issues here. So you can, start, you can start understanding the conflicts. And you look at, you know, say the culture wars in the United States, and yeah, big time. And, you know, you have the... Um, kind of Fox Newsy blue orange thing going on over here and during the during the Bush era you know greens really felt left out why because they were really left out and uh, uh, you know uh, both Clinton and Obama have kind of you know I think uh, Clinton especially was kind of an orange green thing and I think Obama's actually put in some some really integral stuff but you still have these conflicts of these lower levels and people who are stirring the pot and using it for their own political agendas to keep everybody pissed off at each other so it's very difficult but what you do learn at at the second tier level of awareness is that you have to talk to everybody on the level they're at if you're going to get um any traction so if you go to a, a blue group of fundamentalists you know bible believing you know church members and you say you know we're having environmental issues here and you get all the the data and all the stuff that's developed by orange and green and show them the facts and figures and they go it's the devil trying to deceive us. You know, they don't buy it. It's pre-rational. Mm -hmm. They're not into scientific data. That's not how they organize their reality. Right. So if you go in and you say, brothers and sisters, we've got, you know, look outside. It's getting ugly out there. And, you know, and the Bible says that we were given this world to, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the right uh, biblical uh, stories, but we're the guardians of this world. And if we don't, you, you know, sell. what's that? So. Yeah, you re that's a good one, too. Yeah. yeah, you start using the language chapter and verse, and it says in you know, this book and this verse that if you disrespect the creation, disrespect the creator, and you start using this thing, and they're going, wow, they start getting convicted. And you say, let's get together and pray about this and see if we can guard our creator, our heavenly father's beautiful world and do a better job. And they'll go, amen. And they'll start doing a better job. So you need to yeah. talk to people and not where you think they should be, but where they're actually at. And why is this important in the terms of uh, being a healthcare provider or a physician or a therapist or a guide or a teacher in integral recovery? It's because people show up at all different levels. Yeah. And in the early stages, it's pretty much down here in most cases. It's just this, you know, F you and I'm here because the judge said I had to be here and blah, blah. And at this point, I talk to these students like, Sit down, shut up, put on the headphones. Oh, you'd rather go to jail. Thank you. Your Honor, no, no, man, that's cool, that's cool. <laughs> and I'll start. So you have to be very directive. You're not talking to a person who's a sensitive, multi uh, perspectival, uh, you know, compassionate, green person here. You're talking to somebody who's basically kind of at the prison level of morality and it's all about them and they're angry and they're pissed off and so you have to be very directive and tell them what to do and do it forcefully and that's how compassion speaks to red yes. so if you're doing greeny stuff on green stuff on them they're just gonna you know they're just not gonna hear you so uh, and if you're talking to a group that's uh, cheaply orange you need to talk about the science and the data and the test and how this is gonna you know really be financially successful in the long term and big and the you know say, oh yeah cool and here, if you're talking about uh, environmentalism, for example, well, you're preaching to the choir. They get it. You know, that's a, I mean, you know, you can talk about things that need to be done, but they, they seriously feel that pain in them. So second tier, you begin to be able to speak to people uh, at the level they're at. And it doesn't take a 15-page uh, multiple guest thing to figure out what levels people are at. You can go into a city and 
drive around and see what cars people are driving. When I go to Boulder or Durango, Colorado, every, the, the predominant car is a Subaru. You know, ultimate green, you know, Subaru commercials. There, there's ones that they don't even show the car. They show deer and trees and stuff like that because green people feel guilty about driving cars. So, <laughs> so they, they know what they're, they're dealing with here. And where I live in Wayne County, it's all big pickup trucks, you know, American pickup trucks. So, and, and here it's all Beamers and Mercedes and, you know, it tells you a little bit about the, the land you're in. So you learn to do that. So, and you can talk, you can talk to people, you can see the way they dress, you can just intuitively in 30 or 40 seconds you can do a scan and about 95% of the time you're going to be right. And oftentimes you'll be dealing with family members from different levels, so we call it simulcasting where you kind of say enough to keep everybody engaged and give everybody something they can, can attach to. And realize that, of course, in the guy that I was bossing around to make meditate and threatening to go to prison, you know, in, in a few weeks, you know, he's at least moved into this and there's a whole different tone and different uh, level that it's been developing. So you can see how it just gives you extreme complexity and understanding the world at large, uh, socioeconomic, everything that's going on in the planet and also to understand our country specifically, the United States and all our constant, you know, bickering down here at this level. And of course, it's, it's very useful in dealing with your clients and students because they show up at different levels. And some of them, like I said, they can usually within a few weeks regain their former high ground of moral sensitivity or moral uh, values. And then, of course, with practice, the science says that uh, meditation being one of the chief things that can really propel us uh, uh, f from one level to the next in about five years. The average meditator can go. For, and that's, that's a huge shift. And we don't know the data with this enhanced meditation techniques that we're using now. But, in, but just anecdotally and intuitively, we can see it moves a lot faster than that. So that's Barl. That's Dr. Great. Bob, did I miss Good. anything? No, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I have a question. I think it's implied in what you were just finishing up with. And, uh, for uh, all of us sitting right here, how do, we, how do we cultivate our own evolution through these stages? Ideally, that we would be to a place where we can have respect for and honor uh, as well as empathy for all preceding levels. Any, you, know, you just mentioned meditation, so you may have any, any thoughts about that? What do we do in the context of education and training to cultivate our own um, growth, development, evolution? Yeah, well, well I, I think it takes an interior practice. Uh, I, an effective interior practice that deals with spiritual, emotional, uh, conditioning, old stories. And we have to do that work on ourselves. And of course, you have to do the physical stuff to give your body the capacity to do the hard interior work. You've got, you've got to include both these things. But at a certain point, we have to work through and begin to forgive ourselves and forgive others in our own personal stories and woundings. And I think once that we, we can actually work with that, and how do we work with, with that pain and that hurt? You just be present with it, okay? And feelings want to be felt. And that's what you do with feelings. And it makes total sense, but it's totally counterintuitive. Because feelings, oh my God, take some pills, you know, get, go to the doctor and get some antidepressant things if you start feeling sad and bummed out, you know. Um, let's distract ourselves. Let's go party. Let's go have a good time. Let's go drink. Let's, oh, let's slap somebody else around or project our, our anger and our hurt on somebody else so we don't have to actually do, deal with our own feelings. So uh, a very essential part of the interior work is where you go down and you work through level and level of your own wounding and your own hurt and your own forgiving yourself. I think a lot of us, I know, I, you know, I just thought I was terrible. I didn't deserve any success or anything in the world because I'd done so many awful things. It turns out we all have done awful things, you know. It's a matter of degrees, but we've all done stuff that we wish we hadn't of if we knew then what we knew now, et cetera. But we have to work through that. And once we get through that part, then um, uh, of nature, just naturally, forgiveness and compassion begin to emerge. And that's what all the great traditions say. If you go deep enough inside, you will reach that level where compassion emerges. And one time I was listening on NPR and the Dalai Lama was being interviewed and <clears throat> there was, they were talking about these overtone chanting match, monks and the Mwah, and just this amazing sound. And they asked him afterwards, they said, ah, your holiness, what is, why do you do this stuff? What's the purpose of this? Wow, and stuff. He says, he said, to help us to be kinder to one another. 
Well, if that ain't about it. And what a profound and beautiful, simple answer. And that is the fruit of inner contemplative spiritual emotional work is that we begin to forgive ourselves, accept ourselves as part of the universe. And at the same time, we begin to uh, forgive others and compassion begins to arise. Not as something that we have to program into ourselves, but I really believe it's just our essential nature. If we, if we have the, you know, we have the, the wisdom and the stick to or a good coach or a good guide to help us get into that work and then we can get to those levels where the old stuff dissolves and the deepest, truest stuff begins to emerge more and more and we stabilize it over time. Thank you, John. I wonder if, if we might uh, move into a dialogue with the audience. Would you be up for that? I know we haven't covered everything under the sun. That, um, yeah, it's that time, isn't it? Yeah. yeah is that, can I just say something about states? You can say whatever really you want to, John. Okay. We're, we're the cool last, we're, and it ends with types and pers personality types, and we use the Enneagram uh, mostly because it's a brilliant system and a very useful. I've worked with it for years, et cetera. But I won't, we don't have time to get into that. But I will say something about, we, we learn about states of consciousness, okay? And states are simply the way we feel uh, moment to moment. So we could be feeling <sighs> boredom, uh, tiredness, anxiety, stress, bliss, horniness, inspiration, whatever, all these things. And, and, and all of these things, things come and go. A state is temporary by its very nature. Yeah. So if you're feeling really, really terrible right now, just hang out and eventually you won't. And that's what's important to tell depressed people that want to take their lives. Is just don't do it. It'll shift. And, and when you're in, the, in, in depression, that state, you feel like it's eternal and there's no way out. And that's why, you know, we commit suicide when we do. So states are very important. And in the terms of recovery, it's huge because the whole uh, journey of addiction can be seen as avoiding certain states. You don't want to feel depressed. You don't want to feel stupid. You don't want to feel anxious. You don't want to feel socially inept, whatever, or uncreative. You want to feel these other things, and you want, uh, or you want to avoid that, and you want to feel blissful, you want to feel smart, you want to feel cool, you want to feel full of energy, whatever particular drug uh, that you're using. You want to just be free of your ego and all your stuff. So you're, you're repressing certain states with drugs and, and different behaviors, and you're, you're attaching to other states, which by their very nature don't last. Because they're drugs. The drugs go out of your system and your brain starts reorganizing itself so it takes more and more drugs to get the same lift. And pretty soon you're not even doing it to get high anymore. You still want to get dope sick. And so it just goes downhill from that. So when I teach about states to addicts, they get it. Yeah. Their whole lives have been evolved chasing or avoiding states. And so when we, in, in this practice, in the integral practice, we learn just to accept stuff that comes up the pain and the hurt and, and even the joy not attaching with it and how do we do that is that we become more and more identified and stabilize this identification with being the pure awareness and spaciousness that all this stuff rises in moment to moment okay and when you can do that you can just let grief come up and it's gone I, I recently had to move to Texas to take care of family stuff my parents who are aging and whatnot, and I went through this thing, I was leaving my home in Utah, and I didn't realize how attached I was to that place's home, and I went through this process of grief. And I just, was, my, my ego was saying, this is gonna kill you, you're so sad. And I just stayed with the, and then after about a week, it was like, okay, this is where I am now, and I, I love Utah, and it, it is my home, and I appreciate it more than ever now because of this, but I got through that stage, and I didn't try to avoid it or distract myself. So learning about states in a contemplative practice, and of course all the work and the stuff that we learn while we're sitting on the cushion, and while we have the headphones on, translates to how we can move moment to moment uh, through life. And you hear something on the radio about some genocide or horrible thing, and you feel that pain, you just, be, just allow it to be there, you know, and you can keep functioning and allow it to do its work. And when we work with states and we allow them to be there and when they release it always takes us to something deeper and better and in the avoidance there I mean you can say a lot of our culture is all about avoiding states and latching on to certain others you know look at advertisements and and the the inner work is just to learn to be absolutely present and bless it and when something really heavy starts coming on I just go thank you teacher that's one of my little tools that I use and I just stay with it because I know if it's really heavy the thing on the other side, it's going to be a very powerful uh, lesson. It's going to be a very powerful release. It's going to take me to a, teach me something good or put me in a very deep place. So, uh, and as we continue to practice, you can not only deal with all our personal stuff, which is vast, by the way. You start doing this interior work, we are really big. There's a lot of stuff down there. But it also connects us to the suffering of others, too. The collective suffering of people, present, past, future, etc. So that's when the uh, spiritual practice gets really deep. And we come out of that with more compassion, more commitment to, to 
to be a vehicle of healing. And John Lennon said we can be part of the problem or part of the solution. So I would say that our recovery work and our integral practice is, uh, is for that. So we can personally become part of the solution and achieve what we individually need to do as a part of this collective thing that we're in together. Express our individual's unique, beautiful gifts and do all the work necessary. And you can't do that when you're depressed. You can't do that when you're killing yourself with drugs and alcohol. So you have to do that. But that's just the first part of the game. The next part is becoming who and what we're really supposed to be. And that's quite exciting. And my next book, and then I'll allow questions, is, is basically the working idea is integral recovery for the rest of us. Because everything that we've learned in the trenches with our beloved addicts and alcoholics is actually completely applicable to everyone that has a body and a brain and, and moves mm -hmm. and grooves through the earth. And we need more of us to show up in the best that we possible because we're really, really in very challenging times. So we need to take advantage of the tools, the maps, the techniques, the persistence, the, the new communities that are rising so that we can be there for all of us to include the dogs and the cats and the trees and the, everybody else, brothers and sisters that are on the planet. So. Thank here. you, John. Oh, Great, yes. Thank you. thank you so much. I'll start out uh, uh, with some questions from the uh, virtual audience, and I'll let the uh, in-person crowd here kind of gather their thoughts. Uh, lots of questions coming in, and many of them, I hope this first one isn't too, too uh, basic, but it might be a good place to start. There are lots of questions that I, I've received uh, asking whether this behavior or that behavior, whether you would consider it addictive. So I guess the most kind of begs the very most fundamental question, how would you define an addict? How would you define uh, addiction? Addiction, or addictive behavior, or addiction in general? Addiction in general. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And yeah, there are other kinds of addictions also. There's behavioral addictions, there's sex addiction, works addiction, extreme sport addictions, all uh, internet addiction, pornography addictions. And basically it's, it's working with the same part of the brain. It's the reptilian brain stem, it's the reward system, the amygdala, the, the, um, uh, uh, the neurochemicals that make us think it's okay. okay? And, and that gets uh, uh, taken over by the substances are in many cases the, the behaviors. And it's the same progression. It starts out as a small thing, and pretty soon you have to do more and more to get the same bump. And so you start, in, in the case of sex addiction, you start acting out in ways that just horrify you and shame you. I mean, for people who have that level of development of conscious, and why am I doing that? Yet you can't control the behavior. So one of the definitions of addiction, any addiction, whether it's substance or behavioral, is that a progressive loss of control and overpowering uh, compulsions to do stuff and you can see the catastrophic effects that it's having in your life and you can't stop that's good. and that's a good de definition of hell also uh, that's good. talking about addiction to substances uh, a number of questions came in in this area too uh, is the addictive behavior its treatment and your success rate similar across substances and if it's not, is there a hierarchy? A hierarchy that you know, it's really hard to say. And, and it probably, you know, I've worked with more, you know, more heroin addicts and more alcoholics and very few meth addicts, for example. So, my, you know, and, and the people that we work with anecdotally are rather small. Uh, I would say that in the case of heroin and alcohol, it's, it's, I mean, the levels are pretty much the same and marijuana. And, and I've had very little... Uh, uh, actually personal in the last 10 years working with meth addicts. Now, sometimes we get the kind of garbage can addicts, which they take everything simultaneously, and I've worked with some of those. May I, may I respond here too, Sure. Tom? There's uh, research coming out of UCLA right now. Dr. Richard Ross and his, has uh, been publishing research looking at gradations of addiction and responsiveness to treatment. And for example, um, uh, uh, if our normal baseline level of dopamine is at a one, that our normal sexual response will typically double that in terms of dopamine, and that's associated with subjective experiences of pleasure. Uh, uh, cocaine will quadruple our normal baseline level, so it goes from a factor of one to a factor of four. But to put this in perspective, methamphetamine is 12 times our baseline level, 12 yeah. times as far as our baseline level, just to suggest how addictive the substance is and how resistant it is to treatment, because once that grabs a hold of pleasure, it becomes equated with survival. And at that level, 12 times your normal baseline level, that's what you're up against. And so there are, there are data coming in to suggest that this is why some addictions are more or less resistant to treatment with meth kind of at the top right now. 
Yeah, and I don't believe that's an absolute, but I mean, it's just it's just the devil's drug. I mean, the 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 destruction of the body. You know, I mean, a heroin heroin addict can, or drinker can go on doing this for years, yeah. but six six months of being hooked to meth, and you are just a Trash. you're just a shadow of, yeah. of your former self. I mean, just your teeth are falling out and the scabs, and it's just it's just the most brutal thing ever. And and I I would think that um, that integral recovery could really be helpful there, but it would have to be at a different level. There would have to be just so much away from drugs, residential, just building up the upper right quadrant, the physical stuff, to start to get the brain even in a place where it can begin to think about the higher stuff. So it's very, that's very, very low level of hell and it would take a lot of work, but you still have to include all the things we've been talking about. And for you guys that are out there working with that, you know, God bless, it takes a lot of courage. Also, a lot of questions kind of grouping on this topic here. What strategies do you, uh, do you use with resistant, skeptical, or cynical clients, either to their resistance might be to treatment in general, or it might be to treatment along one of the quadrants? Uh, uh, many were asking about those who are, might be particularly resistant to meditation, for, for yeah, example. Good question. Well, you know, I, I also work with, with clients uh, right now, I'm not doing any more residential stuff. Pam said, enough. I did that for about eight years. And said, You're really tired. I went, I am? <laughs> it was, but we learned a lot. So I've been working on Skype. And at a certain level, I can work with people very successfully via Skype. And other levels, you know, the, like your meth, meth addicts. And yeah, me having, you know, two conversations a week and saying meditate, it's not going to do it. You're gonna, it takes a whole other level of intervention at that point. But one of the things about, you know, some of my clients, I don't even talk about any of this aqua map to way down the road. I mean, the integral thing and, and being an um, uh, integrally informed health professional, therapist, guide, coach, whatever, you meet people where they're at. Yeah. And if the, you know, the elephant in the room doesn't have a darn thing to do about quadrants, I mean, you could, you're obviously, you can say, well, that's the right thing. You're not, that's not your job at that point. Your job is to, to get them out of the burning building and, and handle what's there. And then if you know, the sexual abuse comes up, that's where you go. And so it's very intuitive. Now, generally speaking, we eventually I cover all the stuff and and not everybody's you know supposed to work with me I, yeah, as a therapist just part of ethics or or a coach or a guide you find the people that are you, you know you have medicine there's some consistency and frankly I don't want to work I have very limited time now so I want to work with people who really want to do the work so I do very well there now in in, in residential things and wilderness programs, you have all kinds of ways that you can uh, manipulate and get people to uh, do the right things until they can start making the right decisions themselves. I mean, when the addict, the really late progression addict is the one that's calling the shots, I hate that addict, and I'm really trying to save this person's life. I hate the addiction, but I love the addict. In other words, I love the person. So I will be forceful, ruthless, to jam him up, get him thrown in jail, whatever it takes to save this person's life. And sometimes, you, so you're just dealing with what arises in the moment. And of course, uh, knowing the integral stuff, you, you can work more skillfully because you're including whether you start introducing them to the concepts of lines and this or that, is, it just depends on the individual and where okay. they're at. Could you discuss the challenges and, ad and advantages, if any, that you see uh, uh, when someone who is not in recovery is working with those who are? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, could you for, say for, that? If, if the uh, person providing the treatment is not in recovery, what, uh, what challenges or maybe advantages does that present? Um, well, it's, it's a very useful perspective among many. And traditionally, that's been one of the, um, the uh, perspectives that's been most valued in the, in the movement, especially coming out of AA and 12 Steps, because it's addicts helping addicts, alcoholics helping alcoholics, and it's a very powerful model that's helped a lot of people. Uh, it doesn't also, you know, it works for 10% of the time for 10% of the people, but even if you take 10%, and these numbers are hard to come by because there's not a lot of research, because it's, it's, it's a religion, they don't like all that stuff. So. But saying that, um, I think it's a very valued perspective, and you can be a recovering addict and completely a terrible coach or guide or therapist, and you can be, or you could be somebody who's not necessarily an addict, but is, you know, has worked, listened, understood, been empathetic enough, been in the trenches, and you can be great. So it's it's a valuable perspective, but it's not essential. Well, no, can I, I, I put a little PS to that? I, uh, knowing you as well as I do, and all, in fact, what you shared with us earlier personally, even though your own journey is not taking you through addiction, it's certainly taking you through tremendous suffering. And it seems like to me that what's incumbent upon us as therapists is to have our own relationship to that, the sense of, 
of suffering that will not answer to easy prayers or easy solutions and the, the surrendering into that that's required if one is to survive that, that if we as therapists have access to that, that's the key it seems like to me is the, the, the dynamic or the depth and insofar as I have a relationship to that, as, as you do, as you're sharing, that transmits itself. Uh, Stephen Beasley was here earlier and a couple of weeks ago we'd get him a presentation on the space between in therapy. That shows up in the space and it doesn't have to be spoken. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're in the presence of somebody who knows suffering, specifically conscious suffering, it's transmitted through their eyes and their way of being. And I do feel like that that's essential for effective therapy, writ large, but specifically in addiction recovery. And it doesn't require concretely having had, for me to have been addicted to methamphetamine. I haven't been, thanks be to God. But I have my own journeys around this that if that shows up, I think that that's over half of the healing energy is just that kind of presence. So does that help to fill in a little bit? Um, my question has to do with co-occurring disorders. So what role do you see integral recovery in co-occurring co disorders? Could you speak a little louder? I'm a bit deaf, yes. unfortunately. He's a rock and roll guitarist. <laughs> and I was okay, it's can you hear me? in rock and roll. They just do your ears in. So what role do you see integral recovery and co-occurring disorders, and what percentage of your client population do you um, present with dual diagnoses? Yeah, I would say most of them, yeah, and that's a really good question, and, and uh, there's so much we didn't cover here, but that's a really essential uh, question, and uh, if there's an underlying depression or underlying bipolar or whatever, that also has to be accounted for and dealt with in an integral manner, it has to be, it's essential that it's part of the uh, treatment, the individualized treatment program. Let me uh, add something to that as well. One out of two clients coming in are addicted. Uh, to a, a typical therapist's office, one out of two clients are clinically addicted. That's come out of the uh, uh, National Institute for Drug Abuse. But that doesn't mean one out of two clients coming in say they're addicted. They come in and say they have anxiety, they've got depression, they've got marital problems, they've got conflict at work. And, and so by definition, such a huge proportion of who we're seeing are, do have co-occurring disorders. I feel like I want to add a little plug here. I think that this model that John's spearheaded is ideally positioned to address co-occurring disorders because if you just even take the quadrant model is that all four quadrants are being dealt with and so if addiction doesn't show up initially then we're dealing with the psychological, the upper left-hand quadrant. Maybe it turns out later that comes apparent and we can see how that's affecting psyche and body and so on. So you have a model that doesn't doesn't uh, compartmentalize the human being into this or that disorder. That's what our profession does. That's what the, that's the basis of, God bless the DSM. It, that, that's, that's what we do and there's helpful discrimination in that. But what gets lost is that we're one unified being. And here's a model that embraces all of that. So I think it's an ideal model, really. Maybe the preferred model for dealing with co-occurring disorders. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Beck. Thank you so much for uh, the lecture today. Um, as someone who uh, is in recovery myself, mm -hmm. um, I moved out here over two years ago and just after a lifetime of, you know, looking for instant gratification and m mindfulness yeah. and meditation um, has just played an integral part in my recovery and to, you know, to where I'm at today. Uh, and now I actually have the opportunity to guide uh, young men in meditation practice three right. times a week, which is what I did actually before I came in today at a, at a sober living house in um, San Clemente. Um, one of the frustrating things uh, for these, these young men is because we're so used to the instant gratification aspect of it, it's the whole idea, you know, as they talk about in, um, in the program, the, you know, the 12 step program, the progress before perfection aspect, they have a really hard time with that. They want to get this right away. Yep. And I guess what I'd be asking for is how do you instill or how do you give them something instantly? in this practice. Mm. Now I usually tell them even if you can get a minute or two in, that's effect that's an effective start, you know, and then try to stretch it out. But um, what can they look for that will help them continue along that path? Yeah. It's it's a really good question and it's a really essential uh, issue that has to be dealt with in recovery. And I've really been puzzling and struggling with that. You know, why do some people get it and why do some people not? And basically uh, and there's a lot of really good research coming out of University of Pennsylvania right now dealing with uh, self-discipline. In other words, in order and being able to, to delay instant gratification for gratification down the road or authentic happiness, authentic accomplishment instead of pseudo uh, accomplishments or pseudo joy or just state changes, if you will. 
And so that has to be cultivated early on and realize that the attic has destroyed that. So just to be aware of that, to let the person know that, to, to let them know, and they already know it, and say, yeah, of course, it's obvious, but you bring it out of the unconscious into the light, it's a major player in this thing, and also the ability to develop uh, grittiness, uh, grit, I think they call it in the University of Pennsylvania, is, is that being able to practice and work hard to achieve greatness that takes, takes, a, whole, uh, just takes a whole process of time. And if you're looking for instant gratification, you'll never master anything. Because anything that's worth doing takes time and practice and hard work and putting in the hours and practicing intelligency, intelligently and, you know, they say kicking the habit. Well, addiction is very deep embedded neural pathways of taking and using the stronger and stronger the more you feed that particular beast. So when you stop feeding that beast and you start uh, trying to develop new habits and, and self-discipline and the stick to itness and then be able to go through the dark times when you feel like using but not, but sticking with the program program takes support and training. So you need coaches. Uh, one person wrote a review of me recently and I, I said, oh, I felt seen. They said, John, is a, he's, a, he's a mixture of a football coach, a rabbi, a therapist, and a college professor. And I said, that's it. You know, because sometimes I'm just, you know, hey, get off your butt and go to the gym. You know, I'll I'll guilt trip. I'll inspire, you know, anything I can do to get the person in the game. So, yeah, in the early stages, when you haven't developed that, that character is what we're talking about. You need auxiliary characters and support to get you there. Very important. Mm -hmm. Great question. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the four lines. I want to go and the four quadrants. Um, when you presented the four lines, you applied it a lot to the it, it to the I space, mm -hmm. and then some at the, the next part was to it, but it, can't it apply to the we and the its mm -hmm. spaces also? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the four lines themselves and actually spiral dynamics, it's all interwoven, isn't it, into all yes. four quadrants? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're beginning to think like an integralist. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, yeah, how, uh, these, I didn't know that. This quadrant, this is here, the, and where does the spiral come in? Oh, and there's states and states. Oh, God, no types, you know. So, yeah. So, anyway, I, I don't want to, th there's no simple answer to that, but that's really kind of how we, uh, we work with this. And then mm -hmm. it kind of begins to come together, and we have those little eureka moments where we begin to understand how the model works and how this works together. So, it's not like something you just learn. Um, No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. We need like four dimensional right. models or right. more, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah and just know that Kate. this yeah. is a uh, uh, introductory lecture and you can't, if, if you understand all of this right now, it's like, okay, you know, what planet are you from? But anyway, but it takes time and effort and, and when you begin to, uh, to really understand it, you can start to sense how these things work together. And then a lot of it, you just, you know, it just becomes natural. You're not thinking about it, you're just kind of understanding. Let me suggest something. I know Tom's going to come here in just a second. If I could recommend that you uh, track down John's book, it's a really worthy introduction to all of this and takes it a bit further. And there's uh, clinical examples, personal examples, and he's got a great bibliography in there. You just, however far you want to take this, it's there. This scratches the surface and introduces this. The book is a next good step, it seems like to me. And then there's tons of resources in his bibliography. To yeah, and you can go to the, uh, our website, integralrecovery.com, mm -hmm. and you can, for there you can also get, by the way, I'm the CEO of a company called iWake Technologies that has all this meditational stuff that we've been doing for four years, the tools. So if you go to the Integral Recovery um, uh, website, you can, get, you can also get the book, and you can also get, the, okay. get into the meditational stuff, and there's like free 20-minute examples that you can listen to just to get a taste of it. So it's all there. So integralrecovery.com, John Dupuy, Google Integral Recovery. You'll end up at, at the website, the book, and, and probably the meditation stuff too. We'll get into it. What's that? Got your white paper. All right. Awesome. Great. I wanted to see if I could squeeze one more in under the wire here. Do you think your approach could be adapted to treat other psychological issues uh, beyond addiction? And, and is it? being adapted. Yeah, uh, like the book, uh, Tom Christensen, I think, is writing the book. It was the, it's uh, uh, taking different peoples, how they've been using spiral dynamics in the world and putting it out there. So I think that almost every, every area of human endeavor can immensely benefit from an integral approach. And I, I think it just has to get there. 
And when you start seeing just uni quadrant approaches or uni line approaches, and they just don't work. And somebody said, it was a philosopher, he said, there's a simple answer to everything that doesn't work. You know, and, and I think it was Einstein who says the solution to every problem needs to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. So you need to include the essentials because in, in the case, in, in recovery, if you don't, you're, you're going to lose lives. So, yeah, you have to include what needs to be included. And no, no extra stuff. There's enough that needs to be included. But you, and then you have to, know, to be able to balance that and show that works. With your question over there, how do you, how do you connect all these things is what, is what the work is about. On behalf of the entire university, thank you, John, for such a fantastic lecture. It's really lucky to have you here today. You're welcome. Okay.